Before I begin today's meditation for Tuesday of the Passion Week, I want to tell you that um, this, today's devotion will be brand new. But the other devotions for this week, following the days of the Passion Week, days leading up to the cross, will be from older devotions that I've prepared, uh, that um, we've done, so that you can walk through the Passion Week the reason why I'm doing this is that this weekend is quite packed. There are two main reasons, and one of them is that this weekend is quite packed. I have a Friday night, um, Good Friday worship service, early morning on the Lord's Day, sunrise service, and then at 11 o'clock again on the Lord's Day. So 7 o'clock on Friday, 6 o'clock on the Lord's Day, and then 11 o'clock again on the Lord's Day. Hint, hint. <laughs> so I expect that most of you will be joining me for those times. And so I want to prepare for those times. It's quite packed, and we have a food pantry in there as well. So I want to prepare well for that. Also, I want to do a little bit of soul care uh, and walk through the Passion Week with the Lord and, uh, and so that I can be full uh, for myself personally, my walk with the Lord, and then I can be a, a pastor that is serving you from the overflow. It is good for you as well that I could spend some time with the Lord. So that's what I want to do. That's what I plan to do this season. And so today's devotion will be new, but the others will be handpicked by me to share with you, um, to use for walking through this Passion Week. Anyway, today the meditation is from Mark chapter 11, Mark chapter 11, Dwelling on something that happened on the Tuesday. Not everything that happened on Tuesday, but something that happened on Tuesday that I want to walk with you in today. And it's something that's somewhat enigmatic. It's kind of puzzling. And at, at first read, it could seem a bit out of character for Jesus. As Jesus is coming in on Monday, on Monday, verse 12, chapter 11, verse 12, on the following day, following the triumphal entry, the Palm Lord's Day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat food from you again. And the disciples heard it. So he cursed the fig tree. Now, Verse 20 and 21, now it's Tuesday, and they're going into Jerusalem again. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away from its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. All right, so Jesus curses the fig tree, and then the very next day, we find that it was withered from the roots. May no one ever eat fruit from you again. Why? <laughs> Why? I mean, it's not even the season for figs. Yes, there are there's some early fruit that you could have found. I mean, it's not it's out of character for Jesus to expect something from there. And he didn't find anything there. Okay, I get that too. But then why curse the fig tree? What is that about? Well, it's about the meaning of the fig tree, isn't it? It's about the meaning behind the fig tree. It is not some arbitrary thing that is being shown here or just a, just a flex of Jesus' power over creation. No, everything that Jesus does is meaningful, and especially the ones included here, we're supposed to understand the meaning. And I think a Jewish person, having gone to Sabbath school, would have caught it. But very often, we don't catch it. I want you to catch it today. What you find when you read the Old Testament, uh, Micah chapter 7, Jeremiah chapter 8, Hosea chapter 9, you find that the fig tree represents Israel. Look especially at Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Micah chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. Woe is me, for I have 
become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, and when the grapes have been gleaned, and there is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. Do you see that? I think this is exactly the background of Jesus' illustrated parable. And what is Micah referring to? He is referring to the people of Israel. So what is the importance? What is the message that Jesus is giving? Israel is being, as a nation, is being rejected. The gospel has been offered to Israel, but the leadership of Israel, representing all of Israel as a whole, rejected Jesus. And because they rejected Jesus, and this was the plan all along, the gospel would be first presented to the chosen people. And since they reject the Messiah now, the gospel will go to the Gentiles. The doors will be flung wide open now. The time of the Gentiles has come in. The time of the non-Jews to embrace the Messiah has come in. Loved ones, our time has come in. Thanks to the rejection of Jesus. Because Jesus was rejected by the Israelites. Israelites, the Israelite nation is rejected by Jesus. And then the Israelite nation, I can get in trouble for this, is resurrected with Jesus, but now includes everyone. Yeah. All right, so what are you going to say about that? Wow, wow. God's chosen people whom God has loved, God has rejected that he might have us. And that's true. And that's rich. And that's something that we should be grateful for. Something that we should thank the Lord every single day for. What, what, Precious rejection of the Messiah. Through their rejection of our Messiah, they have been rejected. And through their rejection, we have been accepted. First response should be to be grateful. And let's be grateful that God has opened up his doors to, the doors to his family for everyone. John chapter 17 and many other places too. But let's also be wary. Be wary. The Apostle Paul says, don't brag against the natural branches. Don't brag that you've been cut off so that I could be brought in. God loves me more than you. No, no, not at all. If the natural branches, the Israelites can be cut off, the branches of the Gentile churches can be cut off too. Isn't that kind of the warning that Jesus is giving in the book of Revelation? That the church can lose her witness. The lamp can go out. Be wary. We don't want to lose our testimony. We don't want to lose the work that we have to do on this side of heaven. The work of a city on a hill. The work of a people who are, who are in love with their Lord. Let's not lose our role. Let's make sure about our own salvation. Do you not know that you belong to Jesus? Do you not know that Jesus means everything to you? If you do not, then trust him as your Lord and Savior. If you must, rededicate your life to him again and again. And confess, die to yourself every single day and say, I am alive to you and to you alone. May that kind of gospel commitment be renewed on a daily basis and loved one fall more deeply in love with the Lord, taste more fully of the eternal life that he is because this is your birthright now. As the true Israel of God, as those who have been accepted because the nation of Israel, the Israel as a nation, happened to be rejected. Jesus has made room for us. Let's never take it for granted. And let's be grateful. Let's pray. 
Lord, we don't take your salvation for granted. The salvation that came at such a cost, cost, the cost of your own life, and also the cost of rejecting the people, rejecting the people that you have courted. But in a real sense, you have not rejected anyone you've courted. The true Israel that belongs to you has now been made open, fully the front doors flung flung wide open, so that all of us might come in and be children born in Zion. What a gift. And what a message of not exclusion, but inclusion, the rejection of the fig tree preaches. We embrace it, and we are grateful, and we do not take your grace for granted on this good Tuesday of the Passion Week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sang 